Numbers, 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 right after alphabet. Numbers chapter 21, numbers chapter 21, be there in just a minute. All right, last week, last three weeks, we've dealt with Matthew chapter 6. When you fast, and uh, I'll be honest with you, fasting is good for you. It's been good for the pastor. Uh, I, I enjoy, <laughs> actually, you get into a place in fasting where you don't want to quit. Because you know once you do, you're going to be eating hamburgers and Hershey bars and you know, all that. But right now, you know, you just, you feel good. You, you, it's all good. It's all good. It was you. <laughs> if it wasn't, own it anyway, you know. Uh, but fast, fasting has a way of, of giving you sensitivity. I honestly believe that last night, a lot of things that happened over the, you know, with our youth came because you guys fasted and prayed. You know, and it always takes, so first, when you fast, when you pray, prayer is so important, amen, communicating with the Father, and then last week, we dealt with when you give, and uh, most of you know that if you were here last week, I gave my paycheck away last week. Many of you were recipients of that. When I got to the other campus, I had my other half of my paycheck, and I actually encouraged folks to sit close to the front. And some of them, you know, they just won't sit close to the front. And then once I started giving out away my paycheck, they regretted they weren't sitting close to the front. Because I had a cutoff line. I wasn't going to get past that line. And folks started running forward. And I told you last week, you can, it's your choice how you give. You know, I, I use tithing like training wheels. 10% to me is just getting started. My prayer is that I'm able to give over and above that. And then being generous, just being generous. You know how blessed you are? You know, I was able, somebody gave me a 50 caliber pistol and I was able to give it away this week. And I told him when you gave it to me, I said, I'm going to give this gun away because it'll just be wall art for me. But I know a man that'll shoot this gun. Amen. So when he gave it to me, when I gave it to this guy, I couldn't believe how much he was in love with it. It was like a God thing. And I'm going to say it again. If God can get it through you, he'll get it to you. But he was looking for somebody, a conduit, that he can get something through. Now I'm going to tell you one more thing. I gave away my paycheck last week, and before the week was over, God done gave it back to me through other venues, not through the church, but through other venues, and I counted it up just walking up here a while ago and realized it was my whole paycheck. I got back my whole paycheck and gave away my paycheck. Now, you can't, you can't get the paycheck first and then give it away. First, you got to do it by faith. Amen? So I'm just telling you, giving is such a wonderful thing. I love giving, man. I just, I just, I, yeah, you get a buzz from it. It's a new buzz. Some of y'all thought it was liquor, but it ain't. It's, <laughs> it's giving, learning how to be a giver. So first, let me just walk through a list of disciplines that we've been talking about. First, prayerful. Amen. That a proper balance of the dependence issue. You know, without God, there's no life. So you've got to have prayer. You got to connect with the Father. You got to have a relationship. Can you get an Amen. So the second one would be relational, proper social integration, introducing yourself to your family. You're in a whole new family now. When you got born again, this is your family. I found out real quick that I got brothers and sisters all around the world I didn't know I had. I, I've been places, you know, my son got in a situation a couple of months back, heading up to Virginia, his car broke down. I called somebody that lives up in northeast Tennessee, and I said, my son uh, needs help. Would you go pick him up off the freeway? That's family. And she picked him up, took him all the way to Virginia for work. That's family. They have family all over the world. And it doesn't happen until you get into the so relational. I guess it wasn't Ramirez. <laughs> so it's, it's just re being relational, amen, and integrating. Sacrificial, the proper use of our resources. I'm telling you that everything you own, 100% of it belongs to God. Learning how to release and let go of things is a powerful thing. Many times we hoard up. Do you know what I've noticed is being built more than anything else, Ken? Is these storage buildings. They're going up everywhere. It's like we need more storage for stuff. Uh, look, if it don't work, get rid of it. Some of you got exercise machines that are, are made for torture. And you've held on to them. Let it go. Release it. Don't hoard up with stuff. Can I get an amen? 
Then worshipful, so important to worship God. Proper focus of control in all things, to give God worship. And the influential, proper use of our influence. You have friends all around you. Learn the sphere. Some friends you've got to let go of. Some of the youth are going to find out over the next few weeks, they're certain, well, you can't be around anymore. It's going to shift your whole thinking. Amen. So it's who you, tell me who you hang out with, I'll tell you who you are. So be careful who you hang out with. It doesn't mean you can't, that you're spitting icicles. It just means that I'm not going to go into that relationship like that anymore. Now let's get into Numbers chapter 21. Are you comfortable? Y'all ain't stood up in a long time, so this. <laughs> I love the Old Testament because of its, uh, Dallas, what it was that we used to, what we learned about Old Testament is uh, the New Testament is substance. Old Testament is shadow. It's the shadow of things to come. So when I'm looking through the Old Testament, I'm looking for this. Now, now listen, one of the greatest revelations I have ever had is out of the book of John, where it says, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And the Word that Jesus literally was in the beginning. You know, you think he just showed up as a baby, but he's all over the Old Testament. Amen. He's a theophany. We see him all through Scripture. And when we get into this moment, we were, here's some things we realize. He was the rock in which the water came from. That was Jesus. He was the Word. The Word and Jesus, synonymous. Everybody good with that? Okay. So he was there. as the, He was the cloud that followed the children of Israel that kept them cool. He was the fire. It was over them at night that kept them warm. It's, it's an amazing thing. So when you look at the man, Moses. Somebody say Moses. Moses. Put a little emphasis on this. this. Moses. When God called Moses, he was 80 years old. He was in the wilderness. God called him through a, a, a flaming bush, told him to go and speak to Pharaoh, which was actually uh, his kin in certain ways, and that he was to tell, you know the story, release the people. And I was thinking last night, 400 years. 400 years they had been incarcerated. 400 years they had been in slavery. 400 years their life was this way. That is like 10 generations. We've never worked. We don't even understand. We, we go through a whole week and we can get discouraged. 400 years of slavery. And finally the word said, let's go. And they come out and it was like revival. They saw the parting of the Red Sea. They're moving toward a promised land that God promised for them. And then as I look at what's going on today in Israel and Palestine, I see it here. I still see it in the Old Testament. When you get to chapter 20, several things happen. Moses' sister dies, Miriam. And she was a leader in his life. She was an older sister. Amen. We also find out that after that, that Moses got mad. He got mad at the people as the pastor. Be careful, pastor. Don't get mad at the people. They're people. Don't forget that people are people. And they'll say stuff, and gossip can start, and discouragement can start, and they try to, try to get mad at you because of the problems they're having. Pastor, don't get mad at the people. And he got mad, and he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. And the rock was Christ. And water came out, but God got upset with him. He said, you and Aaron are never going to make it to the promised land. Then Aaron dies. But Aaron goes to a mountain. They remove his robe and his clothes. They put it on his son. And then Aaron dies. Now, let me just mention this to you. When you've got people around you, let's say like Pastor Joseph, and I've had Pastor David, and Josiah, and others. What if God said, I'm going to take him off the scene, I'm going to take David off the scene, and Josiah, you're going to be all alone. That feeling of being alone is discouraging. When you think that, that nobody's there anymore to help you out, to lead the people. Then this happened. They traveled from Mount Or along the route of the Red Sea. When you saw the Red Sea, it ought to be exciting to you because you saw that God parted it. To go around Edom. But the people grew impatient. They became discouraged on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses. They said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no bread. There's no water. We detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent snakes among them. They bit the people, and many of the Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we sinned. We messed up. Forgive us. Then we spoke against the Lord and up against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. And Moses prayed for the people. 
The Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake, put it on a pole, and when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the pole, he lived. I think of what happened, not just last night, but what's happened in our churches over the years, that we've had these wonderful mountaintop experiences, these great, look, look at, look at, uh, it's just not on the overhead, but, but look at verse chapter 21. Look at the very beginning of it. It says, when the Canaanite king of Aram, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming along the road, he attacked the Israelites and captured some of them. Then Israel made this vow to the Lord. If you will deliver these people into our hands, we will totally destroy their cities. The Lord listened to Israel's plea and gave the Canaanites over to them. They completely destroyed them in their towns. So the place was named uh, Horma. Listen, they had great victory. Everybody say victory. Oh, what a victory. Oh, what excitement. Oh, what a thrill to see what God did. Woo, this is wonderful. And then the very next couple of verses, they got discouraged. They got mad. They got upset. They blamed Moses for their problem. And they said, we ain't got no bread. How many know they lied? Because right. God was dropping bread on them every day. He was dropping manna on them. They had manna. But they said, we detest this food. It, well, you know, here, here's the thing. As I've been fasting, there's certain foods that I've started detesting. One of them starts with the word salad. <laughs> I detest it. I got tired of it. But you get to a place in life where you say, I don't, I don't lie. I want, I want ribeye. I want Hershey's. I want, you know, yeah, and you get a, and this is what happened with these people. And they spoke against Moses. And what did God do? He sent snakes and bit them. And then they put a bronze snake on a pole, and they lifted it up, and anybody that looked lived. Everybody say, look, look. Live. live. And I want to show you something. New Testament. Let's go to the New Testament. This verse here out of John chapter 3, verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. When I read this, I recognize that the looking and live and believing, and belief and look was the same. They were synonymous with each other. In other words, the, it, what happened in the wilderness, it, Jesus, if he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. So when I look at that snake on the pole and that curse at that moment is Jesus on the cross. You see it? He's all, he's, he's everywhere. He's everywhere through this book. Can't, I can't read a chapter. I can't find it. He's everywhere in the book. Father, I thank you for the word. God, to anoint my lips to share your word and, and our hearts to hear and receive. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. When I look through this, I recognize the word, and I, and I, and I underline the word wilderness. Everybody say wilderness. wilderness. See, when God wants to do a work in your life, he sends you through the wilderness, the wilderness, a wild place. That's why I use the term holy wild all the time. He's holy and he's wild. See, he, he brought the children of Israel through this wild place. And here's in my heart, I will tell you that, Max, that God has a wilderness for you. He has a wilderness for every one of us. And in the wilderness, he does it because he loves us. Amen. It's, it is not the wilderness that's important, but rather the, our response to it. When uh, Pastor Joseph renamed the youth to Forged, it, it affected me because I thought to myself, that's exactly what we need. I've always loved the, the show Forged in Fire because I'm, I'm a knife man. You come to my house, I've got a whole shelf full of knives. I've brought kids in there and say, pick out one, not that one. <laughs> you know, there's certain knives, I don't care. That, you can have, but not that one right there. That, 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 that knife right there, I, 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 I killed a snake with that one. You don't want that knife. People have looked at us before and said, why y'all carry knives all the time? If you saw how many copperheads we killed, you'd understand why we carry knives. Amen. Not only that, it always just feels good to have something on you in case. Come on. So force, when you think about force, it's not what the knife does to the object. It's what the object does to the knife. And when God puts you in the wilderness, he starts forging you. God gave a wilderness to John the Baptist. It produced a revival. The Father gave Jesus a wilderness. It launched his ministry. God gave the children of Israel one. It produced a nation. It would appear that greater things are born out of seasons of suffering than in seasons of comfort. When you're comfortable, God doesn't do a whole lot with you. But when all of a sudden your character starts getting forged in the wilderness, and they learn some 
things. And I'm going to say this to you. It was the Word that guided them in the way. The Word helped push them through the way. They were moving through it. They learned of God's power. Amen. They learned to obey God, following the cloud, to stay behind. You listen, if the cloud is moving, we move with the cloud. If I don't move with the cloud and I stay back, I can freeze to death. So if God is leading, i got to follow God. Can I get an amen? amen? The book of Exodus tells us by day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night, he put a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud, by, uh, uh, neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. It was always there. And I mean, when, I, when you think about this, what a miracle. They've never seen nothing like it. I mean, got a cloud working on, help me do, a cloud took away the ozone. I was never burning up. Amen. God did this for me. In the wilderness, he looked after me. They learned teamwork, always moving camp, break it down, move, rebuild camp, rest, break it down, move. As a pastor, we've done that. We've gone in places, set up chairs, break down chairs, set up PA, break down. That's teamwork. Everybody say teamwork. T-E-A-M, together experience in the ministry. We all got to be in on this. There ain't no one-man show. Can I get an amen? We got to all do this thing. We got to all make it work. And that, they learned to do that. They learned the chain of command. Jethro, the father-in-law, taught them and helped Moses understand. Listen to Moses. So they had, he set people in companies of 50 and 100. He looked after them. He put people over them. They learned that they could do the impossible. They saw the Red Sea part. I will, oh, I see it in my mind. Moses holding forth the staff again. And the waters part. And as a pastor, I've always known it's the staff that makes things happen. Can I get an amen? amen? I mean, I'm just a pastor. But if you're smart enough, you get a staff with you that'll help make things happen. Uh, my daughter Katie did this video last night. And, and wife, they were up to after midnight. I was sleeping. Can I tell you, it's a wonderful thing to sleep while other people work. That's called a staff. Can I get an amen? So you hold your staff out. Staff does a whole kind, a lot of things. So the water's party, and they walked across the water. The literal Hebrew word is it congealed. It turned to jello. The water turned to jello. That means if a fish was right there on the edge, the fish was stuck there. And so fishing became easy. Hello? Don't tell me they didn't pluck them fish out of that water. Amen. Don't tell me that you looked around and Junior didn't run up into Jell-O and come back. <laughs> come on. And they walked across on dry ground. Wow. And, of course, the water came back over and took out. They learned repentance, that if, that if I do wrong, that God could punish me for that. Amen. And I'm telling you, thank God we live in a day of grace. Amen. We ain't been attacked by snakes in a long time. That's why we do carry knives. But God ain't, don't send snakes toward our sin. Thank you, Jesus. But don't take advantage of that. Don't just keep uh, uh, sinning over and over again knowing that the grace of God is going to take care of you. Can I get an amen? amen? So they learned repentance and rebellion. The vipers, one, one scripture, the ground opened up and swallowed them. Amen. So they had to look and live. They learned that God was holy. There was a holy of holies, the ark of the covenant. They learned of God's glory, fire on the mountain. That was last night. Y'all had fire on the mountain. Amen. Wonderful thing. Then Moses brought down the Ten Commandments. They learned that God was a God of order. The tabernacle, everything was in order. All these are sermons. They learned they could trust God. Exodus 16, 14. I will rain bread down. Down from heaven. Manna, you're going to get manna bread. You're going to have manna casserole. You're going to have manna burgers. You have, and, and you know the word manna had to be tofu? <laughs> <laughs> it's the one thing that literally, seriously, I don't eat. It's made out of what? Bean mash? Huh? S uh, bean, soybean. It's soybean. Yeah. Mashed up, made into squares. And whatever you put it in, it tastes like it, right? It takes on the taste of. All I can imagine is taking that tofu and putting it in broccoli and just having a yucky day. <laughs> <sighs> but manna came down, and, and they had it every day. And the thing is, you couldn't store it up. It didn't need to be refrigerated because it came every day. So it would rot if you tried to keep it. So you had to let it go. Let's just stay in the Word. Give us this. Our daily, amen. I, what I got yesterday was good for me yesterday, but I need something today. 
Amen. So I stay in the word. I keep working on it. Deuteronomy tells us their shoes never wore out. Listen, ladies. The Lord says during the 40 years that I led you through the wilderness, your clothes did not wear out, nor did your sandals on your feet. 40 years and your Lucases never wore out. 40 years and whatever you showed up out of Egypt with never wore out. You still wearing the same old hoodie you was wearing 34 years ago. Amen. It never wore out. It looked like the shirt you're wearing this morning, Frank. It's just the same shirt you had 40 years ago. Never wore out. You wouldn't imagine that. You never had to buy a pair of shoes. You're walking in miracles. I wonder what day they looked around and realized they've never wore out. Everything's still good. God's been good like that. So we rarely think straight in times of discouragement. They got discouraged. Look what was going for them. Cloud by day, fire by night, manna coming down, their clothes not wearing out, their shoes not wearing out, and yet they got mad at Moses. Water was coming out of the rock, and yet they got mad at God. And they got discouraged, but the people grew impatient, discouraged on the way. Discouragement is a dangerous thing to lose courage. It came on the tail of great victories. They aimed their discouragement at the wrong thing, their leader, God, and their situation. They focused on their problems and not the problem solver. They went by the way of the Red Sea. That place should have reminded them how big God is. Listen to me. When you're on the way, when you're moving through the wilderness with the Word, God was still with you. God is guiding you. God is helping you. God still loves you. God did not make it easy for you because He knows that no struggle, no strength. There's got to be struggle. You don't get an easy ride. One of the problems I have as a parent is I'm trying to make life easy for my kids. It's so hard not to. You want to make it easy. You get to a place in life where you have enough finances or you've got enough help to make it easy for them. But I know in doing that, I'm going to cause them to fail. I've got to let them struggle. Hello. Got to let them struggle. I remember my dad sent me $100 when I was in college and I cried. Because my dad was never able to do anything financially for me. And when I got a hundred bucks, I wept. Because it just, it, it overwhelmed me. I remember when $30 would buy groceries for the week. Amen. But, but thank God I eat bologna and not uh, them noodles y'all eat. What them noodles y'all? Ram, ramen. To this day, I have never ate ramen. I won't touch it. It don't look good. It's microwavable. I'll eat bologna. <laughs> what happens is we have this emotional intoxication because of the miracles or because of discouragement. And we get so emotional about it, it affects us. Yeah, examples, Moses struck the rock. He should have never, he should have spoke to it. He got mad. He got angry. Abraham went into Hagar. He should have waited with Sarah. Elijah asked God to kill him. Jonah asked God to kill him. Some great men of God have asked God to take them out. You just read it through your scripture. Uh, Noah got drunk. So he said, Noah, Noah got drunk. Yes, he got drunk. Why would he get drunk? Because he was stuck with his family for one year in a boat. <laughs> Y'all get through a little ice storm stuck with him three days and you're ready to hurt somebody. He stuck for a whole year in a boat with him. The first thing Noah does when that boat lands is go plant a vineyard. <laughs> Look at it. He goes, he goes and plants a vineyard, makes him grapes, and gets drunk. Listen, there ain't no perfect people in this book. Amen. They all went through stuff. Esau sold his birthright for beans. Samson gave his secrets away. Peter went back fishing after all the miracles he saw with Jesus. The great artist Van Gogh, he took his life at 33. I want to say this to you. The greatest weapon Satan has is not a knife. It's not a gun. It's a wedge. It's a wedge of discouragement. That if he can find a crack in your armor and drive that wedge through it and keep discouragement in your life, he'll do it, Casey. That's what he likes to do. I want to discourage. I'm telling you that church ain't helping you. Praying ain't helping you. Fasting ain't helping you. Giving ain't helping you. That church ain't helping you. Hey, Amen. They, they don't, don't even go down. And discouragement starts coming in your life. And you start backing off. That's what he wants to do. You're in a wilderness. 
The word is still with you. Amen. He's not going to back away from you. They were very much discouraged. What happens when you get discouraged, your theology starts changing. The way you start thinking about God, theology, the, the, the study of God. When God fails to live up to your theology, can I tell you something? Change your theology. You change it. It is your expectations that are flawed, not God. I observed a man in my life that, that I knew years ago, not real well, but a lot of my friends knew him. And his grandpa died and went to hell. He knew his grandpa went to hell. And because of that, this preacher changed his theology. He decided then that there was no hell, and he started preaching inclusion. Inclusion means everybody's going to heaven. Isn't that a wonderful thought? That everybody's going to heaven no matter what? That, that uh, Baptists are going, Catholics are going, Buddhists are going, everybody, uh, uh, atheists are going, everybody going to heaven. They don't need going to church, Lee Yonker, everybody going to heaven. Let me tell you something. Everybody is going to heaven. Everybody's going to heaven, but not everybody's going to get to stay. Hello? You're going to get there, and he's going to separate the goats from the sheep. Amen. And you want to make sure you're on the sheep side, on the right side. Can I get an amen? amen. And then he's going to say to son, depart from me, for I never knew you. No, hold on, hold on. But I, I went to a good club. I was part of a good club. I rubbed Buddha's belly. Let me stay. Apart from me. It's only grace that's going to get us there. It's only loving Jesus that's going to get us there. Amen. Here's the deal. You got to let the word come to you. You've been missing something. Before he was Paul, the apostle, he was Saul. His name was known as Saul. Back in the New Testament now. He's a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He's self-righteous. His theology is self-righteous. We now, over since the year 2000, have seen the Middle East open up to us. We have seen the self-righteousness of the Taliban, of ISIS, of other groups like that. Paul was a part of that. He was very religious. Amen. And then the grace of God hit him. God knocked him down, blinded him. Amen. Then he went through a miracle and his eyes reopened and God changed his name and he gave him a revelation. Everybody say revelation. This is revelation when the light goes on. You can sit in church for 20, 30, 40 years, and then the light goes on. And then you recognize that in the beginning was the Word. The light goes on, and you understand grace. And he was grace to the Gentiles. Peter was all about reaching the Jews, but Paul, he went after the Gentiles. He meant, in other words, everything that wasn't a Jew, which is me, and probably you. Any Jews in the house? I don't mean that to bad as, I'm just asking. I don't always know one, unless their last name really kind of flashes up there at me. I get a stein. I think that was the word. I don't know. I know I have some friends that are Jewish. But God changed his name. Philippians 121. Paul said, for me to live, oh, catch it, is Christ. To die is gain. If I'm going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart to be with Jesus, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Yeah, are you catching this? Where, I, I want you to think this through and think, God, help me be, that, be this scripture. Help me be this scripture. Help me to be able to say, it's good that I'm here for your sake, but I'd rather be gone. I would rather be, so what they did with Paul, when you study the story at many times, it's not going to the word that changes things. You just go into this Bible, wouldn't always change you. It's waiting for the word to come to you. See, the message found Paul. The message changed Paul. He didn't find the message. The message makes the man. The man does not make the message. So the message began to affect him, and he began to fall in love with Jesus. And listen, you cannot carry what you have not received. The message made Paul. There were those who tried to kill him. They tried to kill Paul. You know what he said? He said to die is gain. You want to kill me? I'm going to gain. Take me out of here. They said, well, now, now he's happy about dying. We're not going to let him die. i tell you what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to put the herd on him. Amen. We're going to let him live. You know what he said? To live is Christ. Oh, man, 
then we're going to make you suffer. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Come on up, Josiah. I want you to see this again. I heard a little bit of uh, the speaker at the camp mention this also. But you, and I've, I've brought it up several times. But look at it. For Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. In insults. Oh, you don't know what they said on Facebook about me, Pastor. You, you don't know what was said at school in the cafeteria, Pastor. Look at it. I delight. Everybody say delight. delight. I del you want to insult me? Thank you. I had to get to this place in my life. I've been insulted. I've, been, I've never been persecuted. I've got to go to jail. But that was my call. I could have paid money. But going to jail sounded funner. Amen. To be incarcerated in a room with 21 other men that they couldn't get away from me. Jail was fun. Amen. I recommend it to all of you. <laughs> Insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties. And then he said, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When I've hit bottom... <laughs> When I felt like they were, so to live is Christ. To die is gain. We've had, I've done two funerals this week. I got another one coming next week. To live is Christ. To die is gain. The word takes us through the wilderness of our lives here. All of us are going to go through struggles, and that will make us stronger. Don't resent it. Don't get mad at it. Turn toward him. Remember the powerful things you started off here this, this uh, year already. F fast, pray, stay generous, and watch and see what God does in your life. Amen. Work on your relationships. When you face discouragement, stay in the Word. Everybody say stay in the Word. Stay in the word. Oh, stay in Psalms. Stay in Proverbs. Stay in the book of John. Stay in the book of Philippians. Stay in the Word. Stay in the Word. Don't, don't get out of the Word. Get the Word in you. Guard what is going on. Guard what is going out. Stay with the Word. I, I, I found certain scriptures. I didn't even realize I'd memorized them until I get in a certain place in life, and it comes to me. The Word's alive in you. Stay focused on the right things. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, whatever's true, noble, right, pure, lovely, whatever's admi admirable, if anything is excellent, praiseworthy, think on these things. Look and live. Look and live. Remind yourself. Keep looking unto Him. Hebrews says, look unto Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The scripture just came to me. It's not on the overhead. It's in here. Look to the word. When you get discouraged, think about what Jesus went through. Think about what Paul went through. Moses. I feel for Moses. As a pastor, I feel for Moses at times. Some of the things Moses brought on himself. He tried to take, take too much responsibility. You got to release it. Remind yourself of your staff. Let it go. Stay in fellowship. Stay in fellowship. Do you know how important you guys are to me? You showing up today. Fireball. It's so important to me. When I see you here, fellowship. I saw it yesterday. The first part of the video, did y'all notice the first part of the video was about fellowship? It was about fun. It was put together well, and then it went into worship. Amen. Together. So important fellowship. Expect that there will be divisions in life. Expect there will be deception in life. I had a guy post something on Facebook this week, and he's a friend of mine in California. He says, when I first became a believer, I was so, uh, I, I looked at Christians, and he used the word Christians everywhere, and I looked up to them. And he said, the longer I've been a Christian, the less I look up to him and realize there's only a couple of us that are really serving God. Now, he wasn't trying to be self-righteous. But what I reminded him was this. When I got born again, I was a babe in Christ. Right? And as a babe in Christ, I desired the sincere word, milk of the word. That's how I fed. I fed off the sin. Just any little word, I was listening to you. Man, I would catch it. I would take notes. 
I'd write it down. Anything I learned. I remember a man said once, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. I wrote it down. And I said, I, he's not, he's my Savior, but he's not really my Lord because I'm not giving him everything. I'll give it to him on, on revival, but then I take it back in a week or two. You know, so I have this, this love-hate relationship with this Lord thing because he's really, he's my Savior. But to say he's Lord, I haven't, let's be honest. Have you given everything over to him? Are you hearing me? So these things mattered to me. I was a babe in Christ. And so I reminded this man that when you were a babe in Christ, of course you looked. When I was a child, I looked up to all the adults. All the adults were like grandpa and uncle and aunt, you know. And I, I was raised up thinking folk were kin to me, and they weren't no kin to me. They sure weren't going to give me anything when they died. I had no inheritance. They were just, I just thought that. But as you get older, things change, right? You become an adult. And I told him that. I said, as you get older, you become more mature. And all of a sudden, you start seeing things a little different. That don't mean there's less believers in the world. Your, your paradigm changed. What you thought changed. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, two are better than one. Because they've got a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help them up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them. Sir, if you're by yourself, you need a friend. Ma'am, you need a friend. Because if you fall, you think, I'm going to make a phone call to you if I don't know you yet? You need to make sure you're connected with somebody. That's why it's important, Rachel, you're connected with Katie. It's important, Kenny, that at least somebody loves you. <laughs> it, you. You need to have somebody that's connected to you. Two are better than one. So if I got somebody, that's why I, I love what I see in our staff Many of them are connecting with other people. Our church is going through a, a wonderful change for the better. When I see SWAP, what do you think SWAP's all about? It ain't about potluck. It ain't about playing cards. It's about fellowship. It's about looking after one another. It's about seeing who, who needs help. Two are better than one. And look, if you by yourself, when you, you fall, who's going to be there to help you up? I have used this verse more over the last 40-something years as a believer than any other verse I can think of in the Old Testament because it means something to me. I need to, have, I need to have connections. This morning, I wrote five preachers a text. Five preachers a text. I've already got texts coming back, but I sent them all a message to let them know how important this morning was to them to speak to their congregations. Preach, preacher. So important. i got to close. Yeah, you do, Jerry. I don't want to, but you need to. Okay, do it. Oh, did y'all hear that? Everybody say stay. stay. Amen. So you got to stay in fellowship. You got to stay in the Word. You got to stay focused on right things. Then you got to stay faithful. There is little difference between faith and faithfulness. Ephesians 6, Therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand. Stand. Don't make changes when you're discouraged. Don't make major decisions when you're discouraged. Don't try to come across three lanes of the highway when you missed your turnoff. Go down and take the turnaround. Come on. Don't be stupid. When you get discouraged, when you, uh, you panic prompted mistakes, we panic. It's Moses' fault. It's the leader's fault. It's God's fault. Uh-uh. Hush up. Remind yourself of the miracles of God. I love the fact that eventually this too will pass. Do you know that's not in the Bible? I've looked for the verse that said this too will pass. It's not in the Bible. But it's a great phrase. Because there's certain things in life. You give it time, it's going to pass. It, some of y'all are Googling it right now. Surely that's in the Bible. Amen. Conquer things first, then make your move. Get encouraged. Get good counsel. Then keep pressing through the wilderness. Amen. Do you remember this statement, Dallas? Don't doubt in the dark what God showed you in the light. John the Baptist, preacher of righteousness, pointed his finger at a king. I mean, at a, uh, was he a king? Yeah, a king got on to him about his relationships, adulterous relationship. His, his soon-to-be uh, stepdaughter was dancing. Oh, 
off, she turned him on. He said, girl, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. Well, guess who was in jail? John the Baptist. John, who baptized Jesus, is in jail. He's in the wilderness. John sends word through the bars. I need to know if Jesus is really Jesus. Hold on. He's your cousin. You baptized him. You heard the Father say, this is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased. You've seen the miracles. You decreased while he increased, and now you in the dark. You're discouraged. You're down. You're by yourself in prison. And you wonder, is he who really he says he is? And Jesus sent word back to him. You tell him that the lame are walking. You tell him that the blind are seeing. Blessed is he that's not offended with me. P.S. I'm not going to visit you in jail. That ain't in there. But that's what happened. What happened to John was he got in the dark and he began to doubt. You're going to have some wilderness, dark places. And I'm going to say it again. Don't doubt in the dark what God showed you in the light. Amen? Heads bowed, eyes closed. I don't know everybody in this house, so I'm going to ask this question. If you've been away from God, and you recognize through this wilderness experience the Word has gone with you. He's looked after you. You shouldn't even be here today. But God has changed your life. It's time for you to surrender and give your life to Him. If I'm talking to you, put your hand up right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Four, five, six, eight hands. Let's pray this together. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I'm excited that on this day, this refreshing, that through this wilderness, you're going to stay with me. Wash over me. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give God praise in this house. Come on, give him praise. so important you start right. Listen, the scripture says there's joy in heaven over everyone that gives their life to Christ, that those that repent. There's joy in the presence of the angels. If there's joy in the presence of the angels, it ain't the angels that are excited. There's only two things I know in heaven, two beings. There's the Father, there's Christ, the Holy Ghost, you know, all that, the Godhead, and then there's angels. Well, if there's joy in the presence of the angels, who's excited? I said, who's excited? The Father is. He's excited you gave your life to him. Amen. I got to move. I preach long. If I get our servant leaders to come up. Everybody say generous. You have an opportunity to give back that which God has blessed you with. You can also go on your phones tablets or whatever to holywild.net slash give and give. We recorded this message. If somebody said they didn't get it, it's because our internet is down in here. But it will be added to our, our site later. Everybody got their offering? Got your envelope? Normally you're ready. You're smart. Everybody say generous again. Generous. Be generous. Learn to be generous. To our guests that are here, thanks for coming today. Glad to have you, sir. Glad to have you. Amen. May the Lord bless you. If you need a Bible or anything, go back, stop by our store back there, pick it up. I mean, I think we have Bibles back there. We can give out anything we can do to help you with your walk with God. Uh, Joseph, Pastor Joseph's got some announcements to give. But as we give today, we believe in God for? More money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns. Success to the kingdom. Mm. 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 Excuse me. All right. Uh, just something I forgot to mention earlier, and I think several of the students said it.